Jeremy as well. Let's all be united in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you uh, this evening, Lord, as um, this meeting is about to be open, Lord. We come before you in your name, uh, holy name of Jesus Christ, uh, praying, dear God, that um, you might bless this gathering. Um, you might bless our teacher, Jeremy, and uh, bless him for his efforts and his desire and his willingness uh, to always um, present the, the gospel. Uh, may we never take uh, your word for granted, Lord, as we look forward to uh, studying and discussing the scriptures this evening. Be with the many who need a prayer on, on this evening, Lord. We know the list is long, um, and uh, you know the needs of your people. May, may, may you bless those that are in need this night, dear God. And uh, again, I ask that you might bless our gathering, Lord, and each and every one that make, made the effort to sign in this evening. We're, we're thankful for this opportunity, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We um, last week had a, a, a lesson on your labor uh, and our labor collectively in the church, and uh, we're going to transition from that. Uh, tonight into a topic about the dwelling place of God and how we prepare for that, uh, for that that uh, dwelling of the Lord with us. So uh, we're going to start in the Old Testament. We've got a lot of scripture uh, to go through, but I, I welcome the discussion as always, and hopefully as we go through it, we'll be able to see a progression in the scriptures that we're going to cover tonight. Uh, so I'll just ask that you uh, uh, bear with us as we go through that, because we do have, uh, I have a, an aim in mind, uh, but it's going to take some, some uh, detail to get there. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and get us started here with some scripture. And uh, again, our subject here is the Lord's dwelling place. And to start off here, I want to go back to the days of Moses, and this is the book of Exodus, chapter 25. And in these verses, it says, uh, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering, and this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet, and fine linen and goat's hair, and ram's skin, skins dyed red, and badger's skins, and chittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And why is he doing all of this? Well, the Lord is, is commanding uh, Moses to prepare for the building of a sanctuary. And in this instance, that will be called the tabernacle. And so as you th see all of these elements that, that he's asked for the people to gather, you can imagine that it was some effort. This is quite an offering, isn't it? Uh, uh, many different things, specific things, things of great value. And, uh, you know, it, it was, a significant effort to put forth and, and gather all of these things from the, the people for a purpose. And so it starts off with that collection of an offering, an immediate gift, right? Something that was, um, let me just mute here. I think we've got some background noise. Um, Something that was of, of sacrifice, right? They, they were being asked to give of some significant things here. So we'll go from that to uh, the purpose of that offering, and that was, again, to build the tabernacle. I don't know how you imagine it with uh, Moses and the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, going from place to place, and setting up this tent um, or, or tabernacle, right? But in the eighth chapter, uh, verse of that chapter, it says, and let, this is God, you know, continuing now in his commandment, he says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I shew thee, 
after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And I don't probably have to go into a lot of the detail about the tabernacle, um, but you probably know that it's it is detailed that there are very specific instructions and measurements and materials and design all given to them to follow and so it isn't just this collection that this significant effort continues as they put all that to use and begin to build uh the tabernacle so this is quite an undertaking So here's a picture of the tabernacle in the days of Moses. And, you know, I, I up in the, let me just uh, adjust my screen here. I'm not sure how this looks for your screens, but in the top right, there is a square, the size and scale here of a football field in comparison to the, the footprint of the temple and gives you some sense of, although they're, you, you might have this vision of a small tent in your mind. It was actually quite a large, uh, although uh, mobile, movable, it was quite a large setup. And uh, this was their place of worship. And significantly, it was their place of sacrifices, right? During the days that Israel was in the desert. And so there's the different sections here, the different uh uh you know materials that were used there were temple coverings you know that made up the the tent for lack of a better word uh that would cover everything and it was those materials we just read through that they took collection for and within the this this temple uh, or or tabernacle they had that that place that was covered they had uh, a courtyard they had uh, the ark the holy of holies the veil there was an altar of incense uh, they had the lamp stand and a holy place there was a table for the shoe bread all of these had a, a role a function in a place in the feasts in all the ceremony and the sacrifices that israel uh, participated in okay so as we keep going here once they had all of that built they also had to build the ark now this is um uh, still in exodus and it says they shall make an ark of shittim wood two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof and a cubit and a half the height thereof and so what they're doing here, the ark is basically another word for chest. Okay, so they're making this, this chest. And it says, thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without, shalt thou overlay it, and thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold into it and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And what's that about? Well, that's the place through which they would put the poles and carry the ark, right? So it goes on and explains that. And it says that thou shall make staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark that the ark may be born with them. Okay, so... Why do all this? Because they had to move it. And as you, I'm sure, know, they couldn't touch the ark. So there were certain things that they had to take precaution for. There were only certain people, the Levites, that were uh, able to move it and, 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 and do the, the ceremonies. And it says at the end here, the staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put thee into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. So let me just pause there and see uh, if, if uh, we have any thoughts or comments or questions so far. So that, that's describing the ark. And when it said at the end there that the testimony should go within, what's that talking about? 
Is that talking about the Ten Commandments? Yeah, we, we typically picture the, the tables of stone or the tablets, right, that, that went inside containing the commandments of God. That's right. Great. So at this time, the Levites were um, told that they were the only ones that could do this. Yeah. No one else. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's a, a lot of, um, of, of detail. Again, the, it was ornate, um, and we'll go on and, and get more description here about what that ark looked like. And uh, it had a very specific purpose uh, that would, uh, it would contain, you know, these, this testimony, it says. And um, it was really, what was it referred to? Uh, eventually, it was referred to as the ark of, of the covenant, um, right? Yes. And so uh, this testimony and covenant are significant to the ark, and it was this uh, place of dwelling for God. It was placed in the Holy of Holies, right? And <clears throat> it was signifying, in part, the covenant between God and Israel. So a lot, a lot wrapped up uh, here in, in this uh, uh all of this that they're building, right? I, I'm struck by the the amount of responsibility involved here. Yeah. First of all, this is God speaking. Okay. This is not the local president, governor, or what this is God speaking. And he's got all these details. And we look at ourselves today and we just go to church. Mm. Right. We just go to church, and it looks, uh, it doesn't look like a lot of responsibility to me. Hmm. I mean, I've had responsibility. I've had five kids, I had a mortgage, I had houses, blah, 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 as we all have. These people were really going to be burdened. Then they were going to be burdened. I mean, what they're creating also is a priest class that's going to have a lot to say about everything that goes on inside those walls. Yeah. Everything. Who has given a sacrifice? Who has not? On and on and on. What kind of sacrifice are you giving? A goat. Well, any blemishes? No. Oh. Okay. You know, uh, just this tremendous burden. He's mm -hmm. laying on these former slaves for generations. Uh, what an undertaking. I, I assume they got all the riches from the Egyptians, right? The gold a, and the silver. Yeah, and the, yeah that's, a mean, good, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, and, and what you're bringing up too, I think is so fascinating because we can't help but compare this to our day. And we look at all of the specificity and level of effort involved with with what god's asking them to do and we think well you know where does that put us today and you know is it true that we're asked uh to do less today uh it's a very a really good question we're, so we're going to come back to that i think that plants a, a great seed for us um you know for a, a for more thoughts on what the lord expects Okay. Brother Jeremy. Yeah. As you read at first, uh, I was thinking as God was telling them what, what to bring forth. And you, you would think that not only one person had all these things, they all had to give and all had, may, may have uh, one element or maybe had 10, but every one of them had to come up with something that they would uh, host for the uh, building of, of, of what God was doing here with them. And so uh, even today, you, you, you just mentioned how you were comparing it to today with, with then, we all bring things to the, the Lord. And, and we may have a give one gift, another gift, another someone may have another gift to bring. It may be gold or maybe silver and, and all these different things, we may not have 
each one of us may not have all of these things, but we all have some something to bring to the Lord, and 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 the Lord is is asking us to do certain things, and he he had dedicated these uh the the uh a priesthood. Uh, to uh, make sure that they would be the overseer and the director of all these things, and they would, on the Le Levitical priesthood, would be the only one that would be able to uh, do the things of the uh, Lord, especially the spiritual things. And so we 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 see today that as we come together and do the things of the Lord in the church, that we all have something to do as brothers and sisters for the Lord. You know, the Lord, uh, you said, why did he pick these things? You know, he is God, and he had his reason. His rationale would be more than we could even uh, think about. And uh, as Brother Bob was saying, you know, he, uh, he, he, he was doing all these things, but still we have a consideration of, uh, of what we do as, as far as what we uh, give to the Lord and 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 the way we commit ourselves to the Lord as a church and as a, a church body and as the children of, of the Most High God. And so we see see these things and we, we see and wonder, say, well, why did he do these things like this? But he had his reason. And so we're thankful that he had, so we can look back on, on his building of his kingdom and even here on earth. And we, we know that he continues to do that. And so we, we have our, our own uh, calls to come together and serve God. We may not have it all, but we have something to give to him. It, wonderful, wonderful comments. And, you know, it's true that there was the, uh, uh, this extensive effort, but also the group effort that had to come together, be coordinated, and uh, different people had different roles right? Not just the Levites, but other people too, in terms of what they gave, you know, maybe in resource, in offering, or in talents. Uh, mm -hmm. So there was this um, group effort that had to take place, and you asked a good question. You know, why did the Lord have them do all this? And perhaps it's because there's a lot to be learned from it. He's teaching us something with each of these pieces that we're, we're talking about tonight. And we'll bring some of it out as as we go. But um, you know the the uh, uh, the other thing that I sort of think is uh, interwoven with all of this is that it sets up expectation. He's building up to something, and I think we're gonna uh, lay that out tonight. It's gonna uh, I th it's a really exciting concept. And, you know, he goes on here. There's more, um, right? They're, they're not done yet. Now they have to build uh, the mercy seat. And so this gets into the 26th chapter now of Exodus. And it says, And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half, shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat. So we can kind of picture that this is similar dimensions to the ark. And in most cases, when you see a picture of the ark, this is really the lid, the, the top of the ark with these cherubims mounted on top of the lid. And so he says, make one cherubim on uh, one end and the other cherub on the other end, even the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends, and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark shalt thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I shall give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So it's about a relationship. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
the the conditions and requirements of that how, relationship how much right? how much do we want to have a relationship with god yeah that's right <laughs> so jeremy yeah i have something kind of funny to say but um my brother was commissioned to do the ark of the tabernacle in tampa he's an artist so he had all these measurements just like you laid out and he's a perfectionist. I came home from work and I opened the door and I fell into the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> oh, no. I, I said, what is this? He says, you're in the Ark of the Covenant. Get out. <laughs> I said, well, you didn't tell me. And then I felt like I wanted to give something. I said, well, you're doing all this work, Tony. I said, you know what I have? I have the Ten Commandments written in, in Hebrew. Can we put those inside the ark? I said, because I'm not an artist, but I have these. And when you were talking, I felt that spirit of, we all have something to offer mm. and we have something to build up his tabernacle back then and now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but no don't question. fall into the tabernacle. I don't think that, yeah. that was <laughs> God. Good advice. No, that is funny. And and it is so true though, that we all have a, a piece to, to contribute a part to play. And um, you know, th this is really, again sort of sort of uh sort of striking how involved it all is you know how, how much instruction is given and how much preparation and so again last week we talked about labor this is quite a labor to, to do all of these things to prepare as it says a place where god will meet us and again you know the question is is begged here what's the 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 the, the, the similar or equivalent action today that the Lord is asking for. So we'll, we'll get to that. But um, I want to kind of transition now into uh, fast forwarding to the days of, of David. And David, as you know, took the, the kingdom uh, after Saul. And it wasn't until David's day that that, that Israel, through David's leadership, was able to finally conquer Jerusalem and inhabit Jerusalem. And because they conquered and inhabited and established themselves in Jerusalem in the day of David, that sets the stage then for them to bring the ark into Jerusalem. And in the book of First Chronicles, the 13th chapter, it says... Uh, David speaks to the people and he says, let us bring again the ark of our God to us. For we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. So it's kind of interesting. It's a little bit uh, like some of the other kings who sort of came to a realization that we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And, you know, we need to clean up and, and bring ourselves into the will of God. And he says, and all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. And in the ninth verse, it says, and when they came to the threshing floor of uh, Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen uh, stumbled. And we all know what happens. Uh, Uzzah is, is killed. He dies because he breaks the commandment of, of touching the ark. Uh, when he's not supposed to. And so David's kind of sobered by this, and he takes a step back, and he thinks about, you know, what they're really doing, how serious it really is, and what it really means to God. And so, as it goes on in the 13th verse, it says, So David brought not the ark home to himself, to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Dedim, the Gittite, and the ark of God uh, remained with the family of Obededim in the house, in his house, for three months. Mm -hmm. And the Lord blessed the house of Obededim and all that he had. 
Okay, so interesting developments, and you know, ultimately, David's desire is good. He's trying to move the ark into their uh, their city. He's trying to also bring it back into their culture. He's trying to put God back into the proper position in relationship to the people. And in the 15th chapter, it says at the beginning, and David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. And then David said, none ought to carry the ark of God, but the Levites. You know, we learned the hard way. So for them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. And in the 11th verse, he says, And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and for the Levites, and for Uriel and Isaiah and Joel, and you know all these priests, right? The, the, um, in short, what's happening here is he's putting forth great effort to round up the Levite priests. And he says unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. So the priests are preparing. David is preparing. The people are all preparing. And there's different things that they have to do. And finally, in the 25th verse, he says, uh, So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, out of the house of Obededom with joy. And it came to pass, when God helped the Levites mm -hmm. that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen. And all the Levites that bear the ark and the singers and the Shenania, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, the master of the song, uh, with the singers, David also had upon him an ephod of linen. <laughs> Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the cornet and with trumpets and with cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. So as you picture all of this, it's, you know, a lot of commotion. It's a lot of ceremony. And there's an excitement. There's a, an, a great anticipation for what they're doing and what it means. And so whether it's the sacrifices or the music, and we know later on in the temple, David uh, as king appointed the temple musicians. And, and this was a, kin, a regular occurrence that there would be uh, a lot of praise, of song, of of worship before the ark okay uh so again this was uh something they took very seriously and so all of that to kind of describe the manner uh under which david is is taking this uh this effort uh towards the ark and it says they sang and they played music and they danced and ministered and worshiped daily before the ark and as you read through all these scriptures, one thing that you'll hear over and over again, as they did these things and, and, and you know, played the music and had all this procession before the ark, David always often says these words, they praised God for his mercy endures forever. So here they are with the ark and the mercy seat. And the, the theme that they're raising up is this, enduring mercy of God. And he goes on and he writes the Psalm of Thanksgiving. And, you know, that's one of the many things that uh, he writes and, and it takes place at this time. And as we learn uh, later, David was told that though he meant all along to build a temple uh, for this ark and a dwelling place for God, that he wasn't allowed to because he was a man of great bloodshed, a man of war. But God promised him that he would raise up a son of his to build the house of the Lord. Hmm. All right, so uh, although that's the case, 
you might think David would say, well, okay, then uh, Solomon's going to do that. I've done my part. I'm going to, you know, go on with my day. <laughs> but not so. Uh, in fact, as you read through it, it looks like David stays pretty involved with the preparations for the temple. He's not allowed to build it, but he goes out to the people. He goes out outside of their people, even to other peoples, and he begins to recruit the talent that's going to be needed. And he begins to recruit the materials that they're going to need. And he's preparing in great abundance all manner of gold, silver, uh, special wood, and, and he's using these things, he starts to build utensils like uh, would be used for the, the sacrifices. And he even builds the, the pools and the holy vessels and many of the items that would furnish the temple and be used in uh, their sacrifices. And then if we get to the uh, 22nd chapter, we're still in First Chronicles here. It says, and David commanded together, together, the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he set masons to hew wrought stones. So he's preparing even the stones to build the house of God. So he's not allowed to put it together, but he's doing everything he can uh, to get ready. And it says, David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors of the gates, for the joinings, the brass, in abundance without weight, also cedar trees in abundance. And so he goes on and talks about where he gets these. And uh, um, he says, you know, Solomon, Solomon is young and tender, and I have to help him get ready for this great undertaking that the Lord has given him, that the house is to be builded for the Lord, and it must be exceedingly magnificent, is the word uh, used in the King James. Interesting. But he knew essentially that this is a big deal. It's gonna, it's got to be magnificent. It's gonna be the house of God. My poor son's gonna need help uh, accomplishing this. And so, as Solomon's growing and aging, they even continue to work side by side. It sounds like as you read through the scriptures on this great undertaking. And it says the fame and glory will go throughout the nations, through the countries of this, of this place. And, and that's what happened. And I will therefore now make preparation for it. And so David prepared abundantly before his death. Really? That's quite a statement. Yeah. You, you have a young, how, how old is your daughter now? Uh, she's 12. Okay. Well, those of us who've had children, we know. You spend a few years uh, before they grow up and go raising them up very seriously. You, you, you know, they're not three or four anymore. They're 12 and they're learning all kinds of stuff. I would suggest that at the same time he's preparing, David is preparing all these stones and all the nails and all that. He's preparing <laughs> two other things. The first is his son. Yeah. He is definitely taken the idea that okay my lord said he was going to give me a son i'm going to make sure this guy is just up to his eyeballs in this project and the importance of it how uh, part of the comment you, you had written there was that it, the glory throughout the nations will be involved uh on and on and he's also preparing not only his son but his people mm. So he has rightfully and very wonderfully, uh, extraordinarily so, taken on this project, not just of building a building, but of getting a mindset in his people, specifically his son who will rule over them. But all of his people need to know how important this is to God. Yeah. It really became their life's work. Amen. In, in a great sense. Um yeah, very good. Brother Jeremy, can, can yeah. you hear me, Brother Jeremy? Yeah, I can. Okay, it's a miracle. Progress. Um, <laughs> Brother Jeremy. This, uh, yes. Okay, well, let me say this. This is the most important event um, at the time uh, in their day 
that existed. It was the the home, you can say in quotation marks, of the Lord. He communed and spoke to his children um, at that site. And um, they realized it. David realized it, that, that that was the most sacred, holy site in all of Israel, right there. And now um, <laughs> it, it's a center of attention yeah. with, with three cultures right there on the Temple Mount. Um, and, and thousands of years later, it is still a, um, a focus of, of great reverence um, for three cultures. And um, it's just amazing how all of this was done to emphasize the point and the the Israelis believed it, they understood it, how significant this work was. And with all of humanity, it, it started right there, right there, right in the temple. It's, it's interesting when you think about it. It really is. And and it it gave them a focal point, didn't it? Something to look at and and understand in some sense, the significance of their relationship with God, um, you know, and, and we have, you know, to Brother Bob's earlier point, more of an abstract kind of, uh, you know, phase that we're in today. And yet, I think each of these things ties into our day. But um, uh, Brother Richard, you had a comment before as well? I had a question. Okay. How exactly did the priests sanctify themselves? Yeah, so um, many things were done, right? Uh, and some of the, that involved the sacrifice and the place of the temple, of course, had to be sanctified before it could be built upon with sacrifice. And then the, the Levite priests had great prayer and sacrifice. And then part of those... Uh, sacrificial pools, right? They had ash uh, from the sacrifices to cleanse the water. And, you know, there were the, the, the sacrificing of the animals and then the cleansing of, of the water. So th there was a lot for them to do. I'm not sure if I'm addressing your question specifically, but uh, there were quite a few things they had to take, uh, take on. It, it basically then meant to cleanse themselves. Yeah. They almost had to have a restart as if be, as if as before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and represent the people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Well, we'll keep going here. Um so we're kind of summarizing here that the ark was a place where the Lord dwelled that it was moved from tent to tent, right? Really, the, the, the tent, tabernacle, was moved from place to place. There were certain rules for how that was done, how it was moved. And, you know, David comes along, he conquers Israel, and he has this desire, this concern that, one, we don't have a proper place for this Lord's, for, for this, this, this ark, a proper place for the Lord to dwell and he desired to build a temple. He desired to bring it back into the midst of the people. And he, he tried to move it. Um, and, and, and we know that the Lord told him in response that Solomon had to be the one to build the temple. But David still did a great work. And, you know, the music before the ark and all of these things uh, built up the significance of this. And, of course, it should be significant. We're talking about where God dwells. And uh, here's a picture of it, uh, one of the renditions of, of how this might have looked. And you can see the, the staves by which they carried it and those uh, loops that, that the staves went through, the chest itself, and then the lid with the, the cherubims on top, which is the mercy seat. And so we know that a testimony was to be placed inside, uh, which included the Ten Commandments. The ark uh, was placed under the mercy seat, and, and they're both placed in the moving, movable tabernacle, 
Uh, tabernacle also means dwelling place. And it becomes known, as we said earlier, the, as the Ark of the Covenant. So now we're going to kind of put more of this together. The Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, and later the temple are all the dwelling place of God. And his place includes the seat of mercy, but also, isn't it true, that the tabernacle and temple of the Lord was referred to at times as the house of judgment. And we get this idea uh, within the dwelling place of God that as we approach the Lord, that he is a God of justice, of judgment, and mercy. And I think that we have a hard time sometimes in our human mind wrapping our heads around that idea. And yet, in order for any of this to happen, there had to be prices paid for sin, there had to be repentance, and uh, you know, this process by which they would go through and become sanctified. And, and you know, that last statement uh, about the house being a house of judgment, we read in 1 Peter, uh, this verse that I know we're familiar with, but within the context of this lesson, I think it's kind of interesting. It says here, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin with us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. There, there's a lot there. Um, I love that phrase, faithful creator, just appreciating that God made us. Um, but significantly here as well, I think that there's this idea that we come before the Lord as his people and are judged first. And, you know, the Lord's asking us as a church today to prepare. And we've gotten these recent revelations that have been uh, uh, added to the message back in April conference that the Lord is basically saying, I've been asking you to prepare and you're not listening. And he's reiterating the message. And, and this is why. And I think what the Lord wants us to do is be ready for the time in which the judgment will come that we might set the example to the world. And partly it's, I, I think, because too, that the Lord, you know, the judgment isn't just bad, right? When you judge, there is either something on the right or left at the end of the judgment. And the good part of this is that those who are judged worthy to be the people of God are then those who are ushered into, I would say, the place of hiding the place of safety, which might be a transition place into the place of God's dwelling, into the kingdom of Zion. And that begins to tie this together, that there is a place that we're preparing for today, just like King David, that the Lord is, is bringing about, and he's asking us to prepare for it. And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, sometimes the people didn't listen, and sometimes uh, they did. Uh, but uh, when they did, the Lord blessed them. And when they didn't, there was punishment. And again, this is what judgment does, right? It separates. And, you know, there was this interesting uh, story, you know, in the midst of all this that David's doing, he's still human. He's still making mistakes, as we know. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he did was, it says that, that Satan came and tempted him to do a census with Israel. Does anyone remember this story? Yes. And he, uh, he listens and he does yeah. a census of Israel. And, and, you know, I read some commentary on it, you know, and perhaps the enemy was tempting him because maybe there was some doubt. Uh, about the, the promises of God. You know, God said to Abraham that he would 
make Israel as numberless as the sands of the sea. And, and here is Satan saying, why don't you number the people? <laughs> uh, and, and this was displeasing to God. It angered God. And uh, God does this. Let me share this with you. He gives David a punishment. And he says, you've got three options. <laughs> um, he says, the Lord spake unto God, uh, unto Gad, David's seer, saying, go and tell David, saying, thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. And so Gad came unto David and said unto him, thus saith the Lord, choose thee either three years of famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. <laughs> wow. Uh, so he, he's basically saying, look, I have to go back to God with your answer. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Well, that's, that's for sure. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. So basically what he's saying is, I, I could go with uh, three years of famine, three months of my enemies prevailing over me, or three, what does it say, three days? with the, the pestilence of the Lord, the sword of the Lord. Which would you pick? <laughs> I know. It's, wow. I mean, one thing we could say here is we should not put ourselves in a position of being punished by God. <laughs> yeah. Um, we would rather not choose any of these, right? For sure. And, and for me, I would say, you know what? I'll take three years with people or three months with people than before I take three days of being punished by the Lord. Because I think the Lord could create more havoc in three days. You know, oh but that's, that's what David picks. He picks the three days. And, and what happens is, you know, this angel with his sword over the people begins to execute this punishment. And 70,000 people pass away. Oh. And... David takes it upon himself, you know, and, and holds himself responsible. Uh, and, and here he is, you know, he's a representative of the people and, and of their sins before God. And he's, he's receiving this punishment. And, you know, all of this to say the Lord is warning the church and he's saying, get ready. And then he's saying in his mercy, uh, you're not quite doing it. I, I still need you to raise the bar. Not to where you think it should be, but to where I think it should be. And we have great cause to avoid the punishments of God and to be quick to repent and to not put ourselves in this kind of position before the Lord. And so as we look through the, the level of effort, you know, that, that the people in these days went through to prepare for the dwelling place of the Lord to be established among the people, can we imagine that we're the people of Israel today, that we're in the days of Moses today, that we're being led through the wilderness of our day, and that we need to prepare ourselves, that the Lord would dwell amongst us. And, you know, I would say we're the movable tabernacle today, and the Lord dwells within us. And partly what the Lord is saying to the church today is to prepare ourselves as a sanctified tabernacle that he could inhabit us. Brother. Exactly. Um, I had dinner last Sunday after church with Alabama and his family. And uh, there's going to be a great meeting in Tijuana uh, tomorrow and Sunday for the conference. And Avalardo said something, you know, people dismiss him. The fact is, he's a very, very intelligent guy, steeped in the word of God. He's a man who's made mistakes. He's regretted them. 
very intelligent man. And he says, you know, Brother Bob, all these warnings our church has been getting for two years that you alluded to a few minutes ago. He says that the picture that I, I think they're missing is that God isn't speaking to us from his throne. He stood up, he took out his sword, and he's raised it over his head. <clears throat> and that's the way he's speaking to the church. And that was a very, you know, he's not in the ministry anymore, so he can make these statements without, you know, without worrying too much about it's going to be his head first, you know. And that's what I told him. I, I, said, I think it's going to be your head first, the way you're talking. He said, no, I'm dead serious. He said, they're missing that. That They're just thinking, well, the merciful God of Abraham, he's speaking to this church. And what do we have to do to, to I won't say placate him, but I, I will say make everything right. And it, it, since then, it's been on my mind. It won't leave my mind, that picture. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's not a uh, so far off that image, right? Because I think the Lord is saying, "Look, I, I'm warning you because a judgment is coming." Amen. And and, and that sword is there, and Amen. it's either going to be that we find ourselves on one side of it or the other. And, and the good side of that again is is that place of of safety, that place of hiding. I think initially, and I think that when the Lord moves His people into that place of hiding. And again, I think of that as sort of a transition into Zion from our day, that it will stand as a testimony to people around the, us. And that's, in one sense, one way that judgment might start at the, the house of the Lord. And when people see that happen, it would be a wake-up call to them uh, that, you know, if I don't know how many boats there are, I've missed the first one, I better get on the boat, <laughs> right? And I think... Um, you know, more blessed are they who listen the first time. And so we're trying to, you know, bring this about in such a way that we would uh, understand, you know, as much as David made it his life's work and, and works so, so to such a great extent, maybe we have a similar work before us today. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll just share a couple more thoughts here as we wrap up this evening. Um, Brother, Brother Jeremy, before yeah, go ahead. to that, uh, in, in the consideration of uh, David's uh, option choice, do you believe, uh, do you think that he chose uh, the option of, of the raising of God's sword because he is a merciful God, even uh, the suffering that would have to be endured by the first two uh, options by the people uh, would would be drawn out in the immediacy of the uh, raising of that uh, God sword to uh, to wipe away the uh, so many people at one time. You, you think uh, maybe David considered God's ju uh, justice or his mercy in, in choosing the raising of uh, God's sword upon the people? He must have had, had some sort of uh, thought in mind when he chose the third option. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think he basically says, look, I, I trust the mercies of God. I'd rather be in his hand than in the hand of my enemies. And, and I was sort of half kidding earlier, you know, but I think actually, you know, that was his rationale. And he thought, well, uh, to your point, maybe he wanted to get it over with in three days instead of drawing it out. But he also uh, would rather be in God's hand, you know, than in, in the hand of man. Uh, so that was his thought, you know. And but none of those were great <laughs> uh, oh. options, you know. Either way, right? Uh, but yeah, I think you're right. I think that was sort of his thought, and you can see that that's a good point. And uh, you know, we can trust the Lord to execute justice. Uh, more than anyone else, for sure. Um, but again, you know, we find that the Lord is a God of justice and mercy, not just mercy. And, you know, here's God's plan, in short, right, that we have this dwelling place of God, and it's a, a, a place that contains the mercy seat, and yet is the house of judgment. And when we put mercy and judgment together, and approach this uh, according to how God wants us to, 
and we find the result is, is atonement. That's God's aim, that we would make atonement with him and properly go through the process of being reconciled with him. And so, uh, carrying this all into our day, uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, we're, we're like the Israelites in the days of Moses, and we are that mobile tabernacle, uh, this, this tabernacle of clay that the New Testament talks about, and, and that the Spirit of God inhabits is us our bodies. And I really do believe we are going through the wilderness now. Maybe we're just starting the journey, uh, but I think we're entering into that time. And I put here that God is going to build a new temple in Zion in many senses. Mm -hmm. And it will be in the mountain of the Lord, and from it shall go forth the law, just like it was in the ark. And here it says in Isaiah, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So just like the ark contained the commandments and those commandments went out from the temple to the people, the commandments and law of God will go out from Mount Zion, uh, which is also the house of, of God. And we've got a couple of songs of Zion that mention some interesting things here. This is number 193, and it says uh, in this verse, when Christ himself comes down to earth, to see about his kingdom's birth and dwell among his children here, will long proclaim that we were there. So he's talking about dwelling among us, uh, God's dwelling place. And number 188, uh, God brought us through, it says in this verse, and we will sing uh, in the chorus, God's praise through all the coming days, through all the endless years, for he has dried our tears and brought us safely to the land the prophets knew, and here will dwell in peace with Christ our Lord. And so you can see here that we're getting this foreshadowing that, that Zion is, is a dwelling place of God, like the temple of David and Solomon. Yeah. And we are preparing for the kind of thing they were preparing for in terms of its significance and meaning. I, I think I remember somewhere Brother Kerry, would you help me with this? Because you, you people all know I'm I'm not a scripture guy, but I, I remember something that said that from something like underneath his throne, we're talking Jesus' throne on Mount Zion, comes uh, a spring of water oh. that becomes this river of water into which we wash ourselves and become cleansed and it it flows into two places i i may be messing this up something first uh it flows into the dead sea makes it perfect it flows into the ocean the mediterranean makes it glorious and the, the whole land around is blessed by this full of water did i get any of this right brother Kerry? well so many crickets uh, probably more than how I could uh, present that information. Um, I, I would have to do some research, Brother Bob. Really, uh, uh, Brother Dick. I'm just remembering Brother. Dick, this. brother <laughs> I'm sorry, Br Brother Richard. How about you? Can you help us out? Are you still on? Not really. Brother Jeremy, just a last comment about uh, David taking his, took his chances with the Lord, uh, depending on his mercies. Well, he didn't know what, uh, what the punishment would be, but he just wanted to take his chances with the Lord. And it reminded me one time we had a, a Bible study and, well, we were reading about the Jaredites, their journey and how, you remember, they got stuck at the beach, maybe, what, four years, was it? And they were uh, 
brother Jared was chastised by the Lord. And now in the lesson, I know others said, boy, I wouldn't want that. You know, I wouldn't, boy, that'd been uh, bad. But my sister spoke up, Becky, and she says, well, I would take that. She said, I, because I'd love to hear the Lord's voice. And I think it's something like that, where uh, he knew what the other punishments were, that he just wanted, I think, to be with the Lord, however it would go. In, in the Lord's hand. Yeah. <laughs> I can certainly sympathize with that. And uh, Brother Bob, you've given us some homework to, to think about, too. And, um, Sounds like something that might come out of Isaiah. So, yeah. you know, that statement, I don't know if it's there, but I'm just saying it kind of sounds like it would come from there. Yeah, interesting. Brother Jeremy. Yeah. When we think about that, uh, we are the dwelling place for the Lord. We are the temple for the Lord. And in the Song of Zion, how it speaks about we have to uh, be gold to do the work here below. The temple was made of precious materials, mm -hmm. gold being one of them. So it kind of reminds me of what the Lord says about we have to be gold to do the work here below. So for the temple of the Lord, part of our makeup has to be that gold to do the work. Yeah. Yeah, you get the sense they didn't just throw this thing together like houses are made today, nope. right? You see, <laughs> you see houses mm -hmm. built today and you think, wow, how do these things stand? You know, it says... That, that it was perfect gold that they used. It was the best of the best in, in their materials. And so they really spared no expense. Um, and when they built the temple, we could have gone into multiple nights, right, about how they actually made the temple, the way it was constructed. I know you've all heard some of that detail before. And, you know, we could make the point and really hammer it and, and kick the horse here in, in terms of how much effort it really took to do it. Well, um, the song I was thinking for tonight, in lieu of all that we heard, I think our response should be uh, this, and I'll pull up the song so you can see it. Run, run to the place of, of the Lord and uh, not hesitate. You know, there's this urgency, right, to bring ourselves into... The, the place we need to be, both figuratively, naturally, uh, literally. And, you know, in this song, we were warned of the judgments of God as well. And what we need to do in, 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 in turn, right, to, to respond properly. So I'll do this. I, I need to remember to adjust my volume here, Zoom, so that it works. This gentile land is unholy 
wanted to share just a couple thoughts on the song, and you might have some too. Um, but one of the things it says there is, start running now, I think. Run now that we might make it there. And don't stop till you get there. And the place that we're running to is the dwelling place of God that we've been studying here all night. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, <clears throat> I shared this in, in our Denver meeting last Sunday, but on the way to the Sabonito tent meetings, we stopped in Albuquerque and we, uh, uh, we went to church for that Sunday with them. And Brother Larry Hart uh, shared an experience that he had with me. And it was in keeping, I think, with the revelations uh, that we've been getting as a church. And what he said was, essentially, the Lord was taking him through the, uh, the scripture of Lot's wife. And we, we've studied that. We, you know, it says, remember Lot's wife. And in this song, it says, don't look back. And in his experience, Brother Larry said that the Lord was showing him, essentially, without going through the whole thing, uh, since, since I don't have it written down, that the main takeaway was this, that turning back to the sins that we're supposed to be repenting of in, in our preparation for the Lord is effectively the turning back and looking uh, as, as Lot's wife did. And so it was a, bringing some clarity into this journey that we make. And, and again, some of it is, is figurative and spiritual as we try to uh, get ourselves into the right mindset that we could leave the kind of life we're, and world that we're living in today without hesitance and, and be ready to part with uh, the wicked conditions of our day. So that's my, my lesson. Any thoughts or last comments before we wrap up tonight? Brother Jeremy, I was just looking in the experience book and about this song. And it says 1988. And my, uh, my mother was teaching a Sunday school class with the teenagers. And this kind of gives you an idea how the song was given. But one of them asked, can you go design if you're half righteous? and half doing what your friends are doing. And she answered, well, it depends on what your friends are doing. So it's a wise answer. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it says a week later then she was given this song, but that's, that, I guess that's good for everybody. Yeah. Uh, well, I love that you brought this to us, brother. It, it's, it, it, you, you're touching on the elephant in the room as far as the church is concerned. And that's, that's all the, the sword and the destruction and all that. Nobody, including me, wants to sing certain songs of Zion. It's just, it's just horrible to sing, but they're there and, and we need to sing them. Brother Jeremy, I came up with one thought. Yeah. There's a song somewhere that says, there is a river that flows by the throne of God. Yes, exactly. I was thinking of that too. I, I don't know the name of the song. You sure? I think there is a river. I think it is. Yeah. yeah, that's what it's called. That's right. Yeah. Best I can do, Carrie. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Yeah. Before you close, uh, brother Jeremy, um, I I would ask all you brothers and sisters <laughs> for prayer. Um, the this Hashimoto's disease is uh completely exhausting to me, and it's it's uh discouraging me spiritually because there's so much that I, I I need to do and want to do and it's uh really bringing me down and I'm trying to fight it with a positive attitude and but it's it's really starting to take a toll on me so if you brothers and sisters could please remember me in prayer because I'm please. I wake up after you know I, I'm just exhausted there's times like Sister Betty said, I, I don't sleep. I could be up till four in the morning and no reason whatsoever. There's absolutely no reason why I shouldn't be able to sleep. Mm -hmm. 
And then I get up and I try to perform a full day's duties as as a, a wife and and housekeeper and whatever. And I'm just I'm staying exhausted and I, I, I really need help. So please pray for me. Certainly will. Okay. Well, um, we'll keep you in prayer, sister. I, I thank you so much for uh, uh, the fellowship and your comments uh, and support tonight. And may God bless you. It's been great to be with you, to see you tonight. And um, I, I see uh, Brother Tim Scalero on. Uh, if if uh, if you're available to close us, brother, uh, I'll I'll turn it over to you. And and just wish you all um, a wonderful and blessed week. And may God bless you. All right. Thanks for the lesson. Let's bow our heads. Dear righteous and dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for the lessons that are in the scriptures, dear Lord, for the um, understanding the importance of, of preparing that dwelling place, Lord, that we might truly uh, be a temple of God ourselves, Lord. And we pray that you would uh, bless us as we dismiss now. Bless those that are sick and afflicted, Lord, those that have been mentioned and those that... Uh, that we know of, that we hear of on a regular basis, Lord, that need your help. I pray that you would guide our church leadership, help us that we might truly be a blessing and an instrument in your hands. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.